We've got Dieter Schwartz from North Star Genetics today talking about uh, various factors and how they affect your corn emergence uh, and your yield. So uh, just a reminder, uh, as we go through uh, in the presentation today, if you do want to ask a, a question, you can either do it a couple of ways. You can text it in to my number at 204-403-8444. Uh, or you can go on the chat page and uh, type in your question and we'll make sure we will relay it into uh, Dieter here so that he can uh, he can answer your question. Um, I have placed uh, all the phones on mute just so we minimize the background noise. If there's an emergency and you really need to talk, uh, you can just push pound or star six uh, on your phone and you'll be able to talk that way as well. Although in the past couple series, uh, I think the easiest ways is definitely text and or chat. Uh, and just a quick reminder, we are going to be recording today's webinar for the purpose of sharing with others who, who wanted to attend but maybe couldn't. We know spring season is started now that we're finally warming up. And we do have the, um, the, the last two presentations uh, up and we will be sending out the link to everyone as well. We're hosting it on our site so we can send it out to the people that you know have joined or haven't. So you just have to click on the link and it'll be available through YouTube and uh, you can watch our last two presentations if you did perhaps miss those as well. So without maybe further ado, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Dieter Schwartz, who's uh, our corn product line manager for North Star Genetics based out here in Winnipeg and has uh, a bunch of knowledge has been in the corn business for a number of years in, in many different roles. Uh, so I'll turn it over to corn uh, to a Dieter and, and we'll have a little conversation on corn this morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to my first virtual corn college of the year. And uh, for those of you that have been uh, attending uh, in-person corn colleges, uh, that is certainly my preferred venue, but uh, here we are uh different times uh, different measures and i'm pretty excited to uh, be working with you um through this uh new way of presenting to you and hopefully uh, this will be a great uh, new way to share some of this information with you that i think is important as we enter into uh, what is a going to be a very busy season um just want to make sure we're prepared for it and we're ready to roll uh, when we kind of get the go-ahead in terms of soil temperature and uh, the fitness of the soil that we're going to go into. I'm uh, very excited to see some folks already starting to scratch around a little bit. Uh, saw some great pictures on Twitter yesterday, some videos on the lighter ground. Uh, it's great to see some equipment rolling, hopefully some dust flying. And I know for some of you in the valley, that seems uh, weeks off yet, but uh, patience, uh, or it's early days yet, and uh, we'll get cracking soon. So with all that said, I'm going to go over a bit of an agenda here that uh, things that we're going to touch on. Certainly, uh, as I've just uh, talked about, uh, planting data is on everybody's mind. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about field prep. Um, the ever um, present question of, well, what sort of population should I be planting at? Uh, we'll touch on seeding depth a little bit, and then we'll talk on the effects of trash, and then just some practical tips on kind of how to set your planter, what to look for, and just some very, very basic um, tips on, on planter uh, settings, management, um, just some things to prep the spring to kind of get ready. So there will be some things that are review and there'll certainly be some things that I'll repeat. And probably as your prof may have said in university, um, you know, keep in mind the things that I repeat are the important ones that'll be on the test at the end. Don't worry, there's not gonna be a test. All right, so let's get into seeding date. Um, seeding date, of course, um, is one that we bat around a fair bit. Quite a bit of research has been done on it. Uh, there seems to be a lot of debate as to what temperature to plant into. Those of you that follow me on Twitter have seen me weigh in on this as well. I am still maybe old school in this regard and I like seeing a soil temperature above 10 degrees Celsius at planting depth, so at two to three inches. 
Um, and that means a consistent soil temperature of 10 degrees. And ideally, you may have heard me say 10 degrees and rising. The reason I say rising is because oftentimes we're not out there at two o'clock in the morning checking soil temperature. So I just wanna make sure that we have good nighttime temperatures, um, know your soil, know how it reacts to changing air temperatures. And uh, Manitoba Ag actually has some great um, weather stations with the soil probes at planting depth. Uh, so that's a great resource to go to as well. Now you'll see some pictures there. Uh, those are some pictures of last year. Uh, you've heard me talk about corkscrewing a lot. Um, we actually saw some corkscrewing in fields and we did lose some population as a result. So just be mindful that we're not just talking about soil temperatures um, for the sake of talking about it. Uh, there can be some population loss as a result of that plant not emerging if you plant it into cold ground. So just be mindful of that. And uh, I'm well aware that there are people that just say, hey, if the ground's ready, just plant, don't worry about the, the soil temperature. I'm not on that camp yet. And hopefully this next slide will illustrate that a little bit. Uh, here's some work out of Purdue that goes all the way back to 2004. Uh, old news maybe, but uh, important nonetheless. It is really important to get that corn plant out of the ground as quickly as we possibly can. And this really just illustrates that um, if you look at the numbers kind of in the in the red squares with the yellow stars, those are your days to emergence. And as we go at a consistent temperature above 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, that emergence is just so much quicker. So we're now able to pop that seed or that plant out of the ground in eight days or less. And that's really what we're shooting for. We want it out of the ground quicker. Reason for that is we're already, we're starting to have the clock ticking on, on seed protectants as well. So I really want you to set yourself up for success and get that plant out of the ground as quickly as possible. So if you can, please be patient, wait for that soil temperature to be consistently greater than 10 degrees. Of course, as we already know, uh, black soil, it just warms up that much quicker. Um, we've, you know, at the risk of repeating ourselves, we know that a lot of ground didn't get worked last fall. It is going to be a challenging year. Um, if you can work it up early, uh, as I said, I saw some of that happen yesterday. Exciting. Um, but you also want to have a firm seed bed. You guys know your ground in your area. Uh, those agronomists on the call, you guys know your customer's ground. Really make sure that you prepare that seed bed well. Um, zero till planting does work but you got to deal with the trash. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So let's talk about seeding rate. Let's uh, let's segue into that real quickly here. Of course, we got to talk about row spacing a little bit. Are you on 15s? Are you on 20s, 22s, 30 inch? Uh, that may affect your seeding rate, um, depending on your hybrid. Uh, you want to know what you're growing your corn for um and you want to know the hybrid that you're growing so is it a grain dual purpose or silage corn hybrid and ideally you know what ear type you're planting as well so is it a flex ear is it a semi-flex is it fixed um really know your hybrid ask a lot of questions and kind of choose early on you know what is it i'm growing this this uh, crop for um so when we talk about corn ear type uh, and this is a bit of a review, but uh, when we're talking determinant or fixed, of course, that plant is genetically designed to um, not flex on the ear. So that is actually a great attribute if you're going for maximum yield. So that, uh, that, that ear is designed to um, not change its size. And that means you can crowd that plant. Uh, so for example, uh, we can go to 36,000. I've even seen people go to 40,000 plus. Uh, and there are people that are planting it at 50,000 plus. Some of the corn warriors are really pushing population with these determinant or fixed ear hybrids. They're really designed to be pushed for maximum yield. They were, they were bred to be planted at one plant per square foot. But if you're on 30 inch spacing, please don't plant it more than 36,000 thousand 
uh, because now you're looking at potentially spindly stocks. And if you're planting uh, it for dual purpose or you're going to take this crop to silage, uh, know that you'll increase your lignin content in the stock. Semi-flex, uh, great kind of in-between determinant and full flex. Uh, great option. Uh, works really well at about 32 to 36. Uh, works really well, 20-inch, 30-inch uh, row spacing. And then we have full flex plants that are still out there. There's still some dual-purpose hybrids. And certainly uh, a lot of the North Star Genetics solid specific hybrids are on a full flex platform. Uh, and that allows you to uh, plant at 28 to 30 and, and really still get a great uh, cob size out of that hybrid, which gives you uh, that protein and that starch that you're looking for in your ration. So just as a general rule of thumb, if you're planting it for grain, and you generally will have a semi-flex or determinant ear uh, plant in that 32 to 36. If you're planting for silage, you want to be at that 28 to 30,000. Now, when we're talking our um, silage specific leafy hybrids that uh, we're very uh, famous for here at North Star Genetics, um, you want to plant those leafies at about 28,000. The reason for that is you want to create that digestible stock that your animals will love and you'll get the most feed value out of that. You want that uh, digestible fiber in that stock. And as you can tell from the uh, cobs pictured in uh, on the slide is you'll get that cob to really that ear to flex out nicely because uh, those uh, leafies are on a full flex platform. So great digestible stock and excellent uh, cob size, starch and protein in your ration. The other thing I want to mention, uh, as we're talking about flowery hybrids, so our 913, our 932 hybrids, uh, they're on a flowery kernel platform. That flowery, those flowery genetics are a recessive trait. So you want to make sure that male pollinates those females. Uh, if you're uh, trying some for the first time, uh, make sure you plant it in a block. Uh, try to plant about 300 feet so you make sure this stuff pollinates uh itself so that you get that recessive trait expression and you get that full benefit of that flowery kernel uh you want to keep prevailing winds in mind and and kind of plant it on the on the windward side to make sure the stuff uh, pollinates with that flowery male um that's there so um just a few tips with our hybrids now seeding depth uh, a lot of discussion on that and uh, I have always maintained that I want to plant at at least inch and a half to two and a half inches into moisture. We don't want to plant into dust. And hopefully this year, you know, it looks like we're going to have a great year in terms of some good spring moisture out there pretty much across Western Canada. Uh, and yes, I know in some areas it's too much moisture. Um, but certainly uh, maintain that seeding depth at two inches. Once again, important to get your soil temperature correct at that depth. But the reason we plant at two inches is to, um, to get that growing point um, low enough to protect that plant from frost. So I've seen um, plants freeze right off. Uh, May long weekend, we often get some frost. And if they were planted at the right seeding depth at two inches, uh, that plant came right back. And uh, the grower had an excellent crop um with uh, with great silage yield in, in that particular instance so make sure you plant uh, deep enough um you can potentially go a little shallower on heavy soils uh if you're having some issues but i wouldn't go any shallower than about an inch and a half so um variability so you know one of the reasons i put popped this slide up is certainly our, our planting technology has changed a lot and what we considered and perceived accurate and uh, and a good stand certainly has changed uh, in the last hundred years. Um, so we have gone from you know it being acceptable to have about 85 to 90 percent uh, plant stand uh, variation to now we want to be at 98 or 99 percent accuracy. Uh, we have some great technology that can help us get there, um, but ultimately it comes down to uh, checking your work and uh, making sure you know how well you did. And one of the great ways to do that, that I certainly advocate, 
is to utilize what I call a flag test. So here's one that uh, my colleague uh, Harry Davies did in the spring of 2019. And uh, you see a lot of different colored flags. Uh, so he went through and he checked, uh, you know, there's different ways of doing it. Some people do it every eight hours. Uh, logistically, that's a little tough. Uh, some people do it every 12. I would uh, suggest you maybe do that. So you can get out there at eight in the morning and eight at night. And uh, whatever's emerged, um, you put a, you know, a certain color flag beside that. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you want to have that crop up ideally all within 24 and no later than 48 hours uh, of each other. And uh, that'll give you the most consistent ear type, ear size, and uh, will give you the best yield. So it's really important to get that crop popping up ideally all at the same time, because if it doesn't, um, those uh, plants beside uh, the, the ones that come up first will turn into weeds. And here's what it looks like just in terms of cob size and cob development. Certainly, as you can see, you'll see the numbers there, one through four. Um, four is one that came up almost four days later than the other. Now, there's many reasons for that, but really the sins of planting will haunt you all season. And that's something um, so Ozzy uh, uh, Littmeyer from uh, Purdue mentioned, uh, and that's very true. Um, you know, inconsistent spacing may certainly compromise ear growth. You want to calibrate your planter and have that consistent spacing. So we call that plant spacing variability or PSV for short. And it's a bit of a measurement of how uniformly the seeds are distributed within the row by the planter. Ideally, we want that picket row, that fence row stand. Uh, one of the fields that I drove past uh, last summer uh, on the way to the farm on a regular basis, you know, depending on which way you looked at the field, if you looked down the rows, it looked really good. You would say, man, this stuff is coming up well. But if you looked at it across the rows, so from the road across the rows, you could see a lot of skips, misses, doubles, a lot of issues. That's a lot of opportunity left behind. And that's something we can certainly do better on. So, how do we get there? Bear with me as I get to the next slide. So we want to make sure that we don't overcrowd plants. We don't have doubles. Um, you know, typically that's caused by a bit of a planter malfunction. Um, you know, it can be caused by driving too fast. Um, we can have gaps um, between plants. Once again, planter malfunction, but it can also be poor germination or survival of plants. So I really want you to get out there after planting and check your emergence, but also look for why is this not popping up? Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, last year, we certainly found some insect damage. We found cutworm. We found some corkscrewing. You really need to get out there and dig and check why you may have some gaps. Uh, you can also have a mixture of crowded plants and gaps between plants. Once again, planter malfunction, poor germination, what's going on? So really take the time to, um, you know, it, your optimal plant stand can really vary depending on your soil type. But ultimately, you don't want to lower your yield just because your population isn't right. It doesn't take very many missing plants to really affect your yield. And I'll get into the effect on yield based on uh, some of the issues here at the end. Um, you know, the oftentimes we talk about uh, doubles and sometimes we think, well, that's a good thing because we get more, um, we get more plants and more plants, more cobs and more cobs, more yield. Well, as I hopefully illustrated earlier, um, with my um, uh, the, the different cob sizes based on where that plant is and how close they're crowded together and, and based on the ear type, that may not be a good thing. You may be hurting your yield. So certainly I'm a seed guy here. I don't want to push blame away from the seed, but really honestly, very, very seldom in all the years uh, that I've checked fields, I can't remember one time where it was the seed. 
Uh, and I'm not just saying that as a seed guy. More often than not, it was insects. There was a planter issue. We had worn out planters. We had incorrect adjustments. Uh, sometimes it's operator error. We get in the rush. Um, I was famous for when my dad turned his back. I, you know, found that next gear in the tractor and went a little faster. I wanted to get more acres done. So we just got to be patient and we got to go to conditions and that planter, those spinning discs, um, they can throw some seed off that disc and we can get some skips and misses. Um, sometimes it's mother nature, frost, disease, insects, really get out there and have a look. And we can get, um, you know, seedling emergence uh, can really vary throughout the field. Uh, as I said, we can have that stuff popping up anywhere from all within 24, 48 hours to four days later. And that's what you're seeing here. You've got a plant that came up a lot later than all the other ones. And hopefully I showed you before, hopefully that image is burned into your mind, what those cobs look like. They will not develop properly. They're going to give you issues with bushel weight. They're going to give you issues with moisture. You're going to have all kinds of issues throughout the year. So you really want to make sure all this stuff comes up at the same time. So I already talked about, you know, why it's important. Here's yet another visual. Um, yield loss, 8 to 20%, sometimes 25% if it's two or more leaf stages behind. And that's some data from the University of Illinois. So... You know, that's why we keep talking about we want that stuff out of the ground. And I'm repeating myself because it's important. 24 to 48 hours. So what are some of those causes of delayed emergence? We certainly can have variability in soil moisture. And I'm afraid this year is going to be one of those years. Um, you know, certainly in the valley here, we have some overland flooding. Um, we have trash. We have tracks. We have all kinds of issues that are coming our way. So... You know, we got to do the best we can to minimize those issues. We got to get that seeding depth even. Um, maybe that means slowing down. We got to figure out a way to distribute those crop residues. Um, we got to minimize compaction and figure out a way to get that tillage traffic, uh, you know, not to leave too many tracks yet again this spring. Um, seed bed temperature. Um, you know, I would strongly urge you, if you're getting your thermometer out this spring, check your temperature in a number of different places, maybe under some trash, or if you know you have different soil types in the field, check it in, in a number of different places, because you'll be very interested to find, and some of you guys have seed firmers um, and have some technology that will give you that instant readout in the trench as to what the temperature is. Um, keep track of that and uh, you'll probably be able to create some fancy maps to look at. Uh, I would suspect you're going to be very surprised as to how much that varies across the field. So that's why I always say 10 degrees and rising. Ideally, you want that temperature to be well above 10 to minimize that variation and to have it at least 10 in a number of areas in the field. Um, don't forget to check your planter. Don't just pull it out of the bush and hook onto it. I know that's common sense, but really check over your planter well. Uh, I've seen lots of pictures on Twitter and elsewhere, social media. Uh, you know, you guys have worked on your planter all winter. It's go time. You're ready to go. That's awesome. Um, but take the time to calibrate your planter to the seed that you're using as well. Um, you know, I don't need to go over some of these uh, tips here. Um, on this slide, but uh, you know, it's highlighted in red, calibrate it. Make sure you're using the correct disc or drum or however your planter works for your seed size. Check your seed size, check the back of the bag. That'll have some um, basic settings um, for, your, uh, for your different seed sizing. Know what you're planting. If you have questions, pick up that phone and ask. Please, please, please ask. Um, make sure your disc openers and furrow closers are aligned accurately. Sometimes there's no better way to check that than once you're in the field. So uh, very often, um, you know, I used to carry a piece of chain with me um, that I would uh, take uh, that chain and I would lift up those uh, those closing wheels and I would just ask the guy to uh, to lay down about 20, 30 feet 
Uh, that would allow me to check how the planter is doing, to literally check seeding depth, population, uh, check my trench, uh, make sure that things are adjusted properly. Uh, rightly or wrongly, sometimes you can only do that once you get to the field. Um, lots of information in this slide here. Bottom line is check to make sure your planter is level. If you've changed uh, planter tractors, if you've changed anything from the year previous, you know, it seems like a simple thing, but make sure you check to make sure that planter's level. Once again, the best place to do that is in the field. Um, and sometimes that depends on soil prep as well. Your planter, your tractor will run differently depending on how much you've worked up that soil. So um, check it every year. Just it's a quick way to double check and it just really affects your planting depth it'll affect your emergence. So um, along with that, you know, watch the down pressure. And uh, as you'll see in a subsequent slide, uh, there is no better return on investment than to actively manage your down pressure. You will have to, if you have varying soil types, varying conditions, you will have to change your down pressure uh, from field to field if you don't have an active downforce management system that does it automatically. Um, once again, check in every field, get out often um, and check your work. I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, older planters that don't have all the fancy equipment can't do a good job. They just require a little more intensive management and require that you work with your agronomist if, if, they ha if you have one. Um, just to keep checking your work. Um, trash, you know, we're going to see a lot of that this year. Um, a lot of guys will have some trash whippers, we'll have some some trash management systems, we'll, we'll maybe work the ground uh, ahead of the planter. Uh, we've got fertilizer to work in, um, really try to manage that trash in your uh, seeding zone at your planting depth and um, I guess just make sure check your work um, you know make sure you, your cultures aren't dull um, you know you're gonna have some wet soils um, once again I'm repeating myself but check your work see how it's working in that trashy ground uh, you want that plant to pop out of the ground as quickly as possible I would say with the flag test where we had some some plants emerge uh, later on, it was definitely in our small plot trials where we didn't manage the trash properly. And sometimes, you know, that's that's the bane of our existence with small plot trials because we often go into where we've planted trials in previous years, and uh, we we don't always have the option to to really. Uh, manage that as well as you guys might in a full field situation. So um, keep that in mind. And, you know, as I already mentioned, sometimes that can result in some really uneven seed depth. That's killer in terms of trying to get that um, product out of the ground um, in a timely fashion and within 24 to 48 hours. Um, you know, as, as I tried to illustrate in my fancy drawing here, uh, your depth gauge wheels will kind of bounce over that trash um, and will create some uneven seed bed. But not only that, um, if you have big lumps of trash, that soil, as I already mentioned, you know, it's no secret in Manitoba that black soil warms up faster. If you have a bunch of trash on top of your ground, that soil is just going to take longer to warm up. And that seed's going to take longer to come out of the ground. Once again, that'll create all kinds of unevenness in your crop. So you've heard me say it, um, you know, optimize your down pressure, optimize your pressure. Um, really challenging in no-till environments. Um, try your trash whippers. Um, you probably don't want them moving a lot of dirt. You just want them moving trash. Um, you know, a lot of you guys have invested heavily into RTK um, to plant in between previous rows, maybe to plant in between your soybean rows. That's great, but you still got to get that, that trash out of the way to make sure uh, your planter runs um, very consistently. 
Now, I did talk about the importance of down pressure. Um, you want to make sure it's not excessive either, um, especially in our heavy clay soils. We can get a compacted furrow, and that will create all kinds of issues in terms of emergence. It'll create all kinds of issues. Uh, you can have potentially moisture laying in that furrow that you really want to get drained away from that uh, that seed or that uh, um, that uh, emergent plant, um, or you you know you may get that uh, furrow to dry out excessively. Um, you just want a really nice uh, crumbly soil structure to get uh, moisture and nutrients moving in and out of that furrow, as it would in in other areas of your of your uh, soil. So be mindful that uh, too much of a good thing isn't good either. Um, and then finally, you know you've heard me say it lots on the day of seeding. 10 degrees and rising. I know guys are going to push that. We've pushed it over the years. Uh, you know, we've talked about the ideal seeding window between May 1st and, and May 15th. Uh, during our last session, you've heard Harry talk about uh, when the ideal window is for soybeans. Um, keep in mind, and you guys have seen it as well, that have been in the corn business for a while. Uh, if we get into that uh, end of May time frame. It's not the end of the world. We're still going to have a good corn crop. Sometimes waiting for the right temperature is more important than trying to slap the crop in that first two weeks. Be patient. Uh, cool soils can, can do more harm than good. Once again, you've heard me say it. Um, check what you're planting. Um, you will likely be adjusting uh, and maybe changing corn hybrids. Maybe you're trying out a number of different hybrids. Really check your seed size and weight. Um, in an ideal world, uh, you will have gotten the same seed size for that hybrid. Uh, that's not always possible. Uh, we're dealing with mother nature and seed size varies. So just double check your bags as you're dumping them in your planter. Uh, and you may have to adjust your air, air or vacuum pressure. And quite frankly, you may have to adjust that throughout the day. Um, check your monitors, get out on occasion, stretch your legs um, and uh, check your work. You know, lift up some of those um, seating units and, and just make sure you're still doing a good job. Um, check your planting speed. You know, one of the things I, I've checked over the years and, and where we've often uh, seen the best improvement is just by slowing down a little bit. I know we have high speed planters. I know those planters can, can plant accurately at high speeds, but it's really dependent on our soil prep. And sometimes, um, you know, I have been taught, we have been taught to go at angles and we'll prepare our soil at an angle to uh, where we plant. And those row units can end up bouncing quite a bit if we go too fast. So. Um, no high speed planter can account or can compensate for uh, poor field preparation. So just just be mindful of that. And then, you know, every day is different uh, field conditions and weather changes. Uh, we get the ground drying out from one day to the next. Once again, just because it worked really well uh, one day when you come back the next day, um, you know, check your work again, check every day, get out and make sure you're still doing a good job. You know, I talked about uh, closing wheels. We talked about trash. Um, I keep repeating it. Um, you know, make sure that you're um, not trapping a bunch of trash inside the furrow. Uh, check your closing wheel tension. You may need to adjust that too. So that's not just down pressure. That's closing wheels as well. Make sure you don't compact that furrow. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's important. Um, Variable seed bed temperature, once again, that can depend on trash. Um, check your seeding depth, um, 10 degrees. I, I'm saying it lots, it's important. Putting that picture up there, I know. I know we're gonna have some um, overland flooding. We're gonna have some moisture. Uh, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, obviously, tile drainage would be our friend here. I know that's not possible everywhere. Um, those of you that have invested in that, I know why you're doing it and it's exactly for this reason. We wanna minimize that variation. So 
we want to make sure we get that even germination. So when you're checking your germination, when you're doing your flag test, you know, maybe keep that in mind, keep notes and think back to, you know, what were things like right after planting or maybe at planting as it related to moisture. Uh, you know, why is this stuff coming up uneven? And sometimes it's literally, you know, we had we had some rainfall, we had some uneven moisture. Um, we may have had some crusting on the soil. Um, there may have been some, you know, drying patterns of the soil based on how we uh, prepared our ground that uh, we may not be looking at. So to sum it all up, uh, let's get to the bottom line. You know, why is all this so important? Um, uneven stand establishment in corn can reduce your yield potential very early on. You don't get a second chance at this. Take your time. I know we're in a rush. I know we want to get all that stuff in the ground in 10 or 14 days. Um, but when you consider how much you can leave on the table, it's very easy to leave 7, 10, even 15 bushels on the table right at planting. You cannot make that up ever. Um, and I'm not against no-till. I'm not against minimum till. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I think that's helped us a lot to grow the crops that we have by minimizing our moisture loss. But considering the year that we're having, considering the importance of making sure that seed has the best chance to pop out of the ground as quickly as it can, um, do the best you can with your soil to minimize trash, to maximize uh, emergence and to minimize variability uh, when you're planting. So how do I figure out um, what uh, uh, what we're losing? Um, it, it's very simple. You want to measure and record uh, a bunch of consecutive plant spacings. You know, do two or three locations around the field. And this next one is probably going to raise some eyebrows. You want to do it for each row unit of your planter. I know we got 24 rows and we got some 30 plus row planters out there. Ideally, you want to check each row unit. I know it's a lot of work. Um, and hey, there's a lot of agronomists that are hungry for work and hungry to help. And I'm saying that a little tongue in cheek. But ideally, you check each row unit. More often than not, I've seen guys find out uh, sadly at harvest time that there was a row unit that just wasn't working um, and boy that's a lot of yield left on the table so ideally you find that out in the spring ideally you find that out in your first field before you uh, multiply that error over a number of fields so check your work check your work check your work um, I yeah so just, just to pause here quickly, I have uh, one more slide that really talks to uh, some of the yield loss we can encounter and, and, and to, uh, to kind of sum up. But I've done a lot of talking. I've tried to fit a lot in, in a, a very short amount of time here. There was a lot of stuff coming at you guys. Uh, don't hesitate to text your questions to 204-403-8444. Uh, or, you know, pop some questions into the chat page. Um, you know, there's a great slide here. So click on the, on the text icon in the little um, bar that pops up when you put your cursor over your screen and, uh, you know, uh, throw your questions at us. Um, I'll uh, go to the next slide here and we'll kind of sum up with the impacts on yield um and boy it can be huge um so they these numbers are based on a 200 bushel per acre yield um they are based uh, on numbers from the university of minnesota so pretty similar to the conditions that we're working in kind of red river valley manitoba conditions um i harped a lot about making sure you have the correct population Correct population is about two to four bushels per acre. That, uh, you know, so one, two percent of yield. Uh, very important to get that right. Uniform spacing, I harped a lot on that. 
you can pick up another two to four bushels an acre. You know, a lot of you guys are really concerned about getting that crop in early, despite the temperature. That planting window, that May 1st to May 15th planting window, man, we got to hit that. We got to get that crop in no matter what. Don't worry about temperature. Uh, you've heard some other pundits from down south talk about temperature doesn't matter. Just go when the ground's fit. That's four to 10 bushels an acre. So, you know, you can see it adding up. We're pretty close to almost 15 to 20 bushels here. But what I've skipped over, what's the most important is your uniform emergence. That's 10 to 18 bushels. That can be almost 10% of your yield right there. So five to 10% of your yield is that uniform emergence. That consistent downforce, that consistent crop popping out of the ground, that consistent seed bed preparation, that trash management, that slowing down, making sure your row units aren't bouncing, making sure you get that consistent seeding depth, that consistent soil temperature, that waiting, being patient for that consistent temperature to get that crop out of the ground in, 28, in 24 to 48 hours. Um, that's where your best bang for your buck is. So make sure you get that right. That's really the most important thing. So with that, I'll leave that slide up a little bit here. I'm open to questions. Um, so once again, uh, 204-403-8444, um, the, or um, just with a text box on your screen in the chat window, um, be more than happy to entertain comments or questions. Okay, thank you, Dieter. Uh, there was one question that did come in, uh, and please uh, text, text more in. We'll give you a little bit of time to uh, to type them in onto your text box. But the one question that came in here, Dieter, was: Given I have a higher trash in my field, would you suggest that I increase my seeding rate by up to two thousand seeds to maybe compensate for my trash? That's a great question. And, and you know, I would say um, with some other crops, possibly, uh, and I'll be the first to admit, um, you know, you guys are investing a lot into your into seed. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we get uh, every and, and we invest a lot into that seed as a seed company to make sure that, you know, we have great uh, germ in our bag. We have the best seed quality in our bag. Um, I would be investing time and energy into trash management, into field bed prep, you know, because that uh, that extra 2,000 seeds uh, comes at a cost. So maybe if you have the time, if you can figure out how to do everything else, um, then I would say, you know, work on that. Uh, just to throw an extra seed, uh, you know, with the expectation that not everything is going to pop up. I don't know if I would go that route until I had everything else covered that I possibly could. And in, in terms of my uh, my field prep, uh, my planter prep, uh, once all those boxes are checked, yes, absolutely. More seed, uh, depending on the hybrid, uh, will, re will result in better yield as long as you have the moisture and the fertility. As long as you have the, the you know, as, as I talked about in terms of hybrids, uh, determinant ear hybrid will respond favorably to higher population. However, um, you know, there is a law of diminishing returns uh, if you're just throwing in additional population uh, for, uh, for example, in a, in a silage full flex hybrid. In addition to that, you will affect uh, feed quality uh, if you push populations too high, it will affect um the stock composition the stock uh, quality the feed quality on those stocks so so be mindful of that uh as i said i would probably do try to do you know almost everything else before i would uh, spend more money on seed you know make sure i did everything i could to get that that field fit and ready to to plant Another question we have here that just came in is just how important is early weed control? When, how quickly do I need to get out there to control my weeds after planting? 
Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the earlier, the better. Corn is a very, 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 very poor competitor, and I can't stress that enough. Uh, wheat control is paramount to get a great crop. And it's surprising, you know, a lot of us have learned a lot about wheat control. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an old uh, school uh, guy in terms of wheat control as well. Uh, when I farmed, I loved smoking weeds when they were, you know, that, that three to four inches high. I, I got the most satisfaction out of spending money on, on uh, crop protection products. Uh, we've learned a lot since then. Um, you know, we're farming in uh, in a low moisture environment more often than not here in Western Canada. Uh, every bit of moisture is precious and we do not want to get those weeds, any of the moisture or nutrients that our crops can use. So uh, we've come a long way in terms of even, uh, you know, pre-emerge weed control. Uh, we've got some great residual products that we can use. Uh, ideally, we want to hit those guys just at the seedling stage and get that really early wheat control. Um, we have a tremendous product uh, in Roundup Ready corn uh, that we can go in there. We can make multiple passes at a, at a really reasonable cost. And uh, we have some great products that we can tank mix. Uh, and we have, uh, we continue to get new products out there for us to use. Um, you know, we've never, we've never had an easier time than now to get to after those weeds early. Um, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm a little old school. I remember having to cultivate my row crops. Uh, we don't want to go back to that. Uh, we can spray, we can get in there and spray early and, and really get after those weeds early, but it's really important to hit them, you know, as early as you possibly can. One last question. Uh, in a previous webinar, uh, talked about that we might have to split apple high uh, fertilizer because we don't have a lot down early. What would be your timing for that uh, second app uh, post plant? Well, that uh, that's a great question, and it uh, you know at the risk of uh, of deferring um, a little bit, um, you want to be mindful of your soil type. You want to be uh, you know doing as much testing as we possibly can. We want to be good stewards of the land and good stewards of our resources. Uh, certainly follow for our practices. Um, so we want to soil test in the spring to see what we have. Uh, I know it's going to be a challenging year to get some of that stuff on. We want to be very careful about not putting too much close to the seed. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, two inches to the side, two inches below for corn. Uh, we want to be careful that we don't, uh, you know, put too much fertilizer right in that two inch seeding depth. Um, so we want to be careful we don't put too much on right up front. Um, so I'm a big fan of split applying, you know, great question. And you've probably heard me talk about it. I love spoon feeding the crop. Um, you know, there's, there's people that have irrigation pivots that can spoon feed year round. I mean, that's an ideal situation. I understand that the majority of people don't have that option. So, um, you know, put some in uh, early. You, you may even want to choose uh, some, uh, you know, products that, uh, that have nitrogen inhibitors. Uh, there's many products out there um, that, that do that, that slow release of nitrogen over time. But uh, in an ideal world, we want to be careful how much we disturb the ground uh, later on in the year uh, and how much we, uh, we potentially hurt uh, the leaves or the crop as we travel through it to split apply uh, and maybe uh, inject with cultures or even cultivate uh, that crop to put some additional nitrogen in. I would not go any later to answer, finally answer your question and then V5, V6. Um, and then, uh, you know, you may have heard me say I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, potentially if you have the option to Y drop even later, just prior to tassel. Uh, we don't want to be in there disturbing that crop when it's tasseling, when it's pollinating. Um, so you want to be in there ahead of time. But there's many great tools to make sure, once again, that we're, we're mindful stewards. Uh, tissue test. Uh, soil test, um, you know, there, there's lots of great tools out there now that give us readouts even in the field that, uh, that we can test and make sure we're putting on exactly what that crop needs. But yeah, great question. Uh, split apply as, as much as you can. Be mindful how much you're putting on the spring so you don't hurt your crop right this spring. And we may be limited to what we can do in terms of logistics, in terms of our field conditions. So, uh, you know, don't hesitate to get that crop in the ground. 
and put some fertility on after, uh, it's uh, definitely an option for us to do that. Awesome, Dieter. Uh, one more question came in here as far as, can you please comment on the fertilizer required and how much can end up in a seed row? Oh, that's a great question. So I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what soil type you're talking about. That certainly depends. Um, seed row, I want to be very, very careful. Um, there are many agronomists that talk about that a lot. Uh, you know, we talk about, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, if you're going to ban some nitrogen, um, you know, with your planter, uh, definitely have it uh, two inches to the side, two inches below. You can go on both sides of that seed row if you're, you know, so equipped. Um, but you want to be very mindful of, of seed burn, and that depends on your soil. That depends on spring moisture conditions. Depends on the type of fertilizer you're using. You know, it's a, it's a pretty broad question. Um, I'm a big fan of, however, of putting some starter phosphate uh, in the trench, but you want to be very, very careful about what, once again, what type of fertilizer you use, your soil type, uh, the conditions, um, the technology you're using to do that. Uh, is it right on the seed? Is it just slightly beside it? You know, where's your planter dropping that fertilizer? And then finally, you know, one of the things that we often see is, um, you know, when we're putting on a lot of these planters, when you're putting on below five gallons, depending on your liquid kit, um, that product will come out in spurts. So it won't come out even in that row. And once again, that can cause some uneven emergence. And you've just heard me say that's the last thing we want. So we often see guys watering down their 1034, for example. Um, you know, they'll, they'll mix it with half water just to simply be able to put on that five gallons, but not enough to burn uh, the seeds. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to talk in as much generalities as I possibly can, not because I don't want to answer the question, but because I really don't know your individual situation and your setup. Um, you know, that is where your local agronomist can really help you making sure uh, they know your soil type, they know your setup, they know the product you're putting on. Um, you know, be mindful, be good stewards. Um, I, I'm a big fan of pop-up fertilizer, but be mindful you don't hurt your emergence uh, with something that's a little too hot in that seed row. So, so be careful. Uh, good seed uh, fertilizer separation is important if you're going to put some higher rates N on, which I know we'll be tempted to do this year, uh, given the year that we have. So just be really careful with that. Nice. Uh, oh, I think we might have just got one more chat. Uh, and how does corn compare in fertilizer tolerance, tolerance compared, compared to a low or, or wheat? Um, in terms of tolerance, I mean, generally, you know, we talk about the bigger the seed, the better. Um, there's still still a lot of work to be done to to come up with a definitive answer for you, and and you know, every year is different. And as I tried to mention. Uh, we want to make sure we get that crop off to the ground, uh, off out of the ground as quickly as possible. Uh, we want to make sure we don't burn any of those really important root hairs uh, that are going to be so important for that crop to function well. Uh, if we run into some, you know, moisture deficits or even fertility deficits, um, you know, in an ideal world, we would mix that fertilizer in really well. Um, we would, uh, you know, have the, the ideal seed bed every year. You know, fact of the matter is this year is, is going to be a challenge. We're going to have to deal with what we can. Um, but knowing that you can, uh, in corn especially, uh, you're able to put in, um, you know, you're able to top dress probably a little easier because it is a row crop than you can with other crops. I would definitely, um, you know, keep some of my, uh, Keep some of my fertilizer back a little bit and and keep some back into reserves. Um, you know, that also allows you to kind of hedge your bets a little bit, depending on the kind of year you're going to get and and manage that a little bit. Uh, I think that's the difference between canola, wheat and corn. Uh, corn's kind of designed to have multiple applications of fertility. 
Um, it lends itself really well to that. So take advantage of that. Um, as opposed to, uh, you know, canola, we want to be very careful what we put in the trench. Corn, you can put a little more in um, as much as wheat. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't compared the two. Uh, we want to be careful, though, even though corn is a larger seeded crop, it still has limitations. It's still a grass. It's still a cereal. Um, you know, we still have some fine root hairs that we don't want to burn with too much fertilizer. I don't know if I'd put any more uh, in with the seed than I would with a wheat. Uh, I want to be very, very, very careful. Uh, I like nitrogen below and to the side. Uh, and I know that uh, in some areas uh, in Western Canada, uh, that gets us into a zone in the soils, soil zone that uh, we haven't gone to in many years. So, you know, four inches deep two inches below that seed. As we go into Western Canada, we, we haven't uh, worked our ground that deep in a long time. So, um, you know, be mindful of that. Be mindful of concentrations of, of fertilizer that we may have banded in the fall that that uh, corn seed can, can be in contact with. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if I directly answered your question, but that's probably the best answer I can give, you know, not knowing your individual situation. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dieter. Um, yeah, lot, and thank you guys for uh, the questions that you texted in and uh, chatted in at the end. That was uh, good. Put Dieter on the spot. And uh, and if you have any further questions, don't be afraid to contact any of your uh, local district sales managers or or, uh, or Twitter it to Dieter. Or we'll make sure that we uh, get your answers back uh, so we're prepared for the spring. So. Thank you again. Uh, reminder: Next Thursday uh, will be our final uh, final series on our, in our spring series speaker series, and we're going to have uh, Al Kleis, uh provide a market update on on both the soybeans and the corn. I know there's been a lot of volatile volatility here over the past uh, month and a half in the futures market with everything that's going around us. So it'll be a great opportunity to to hear what Al's thinking and also text in and uh, ask some questions for Al to give you some thoughts. Hopefully, maybe some people are getting ready out in the fields at that time. Um, so we will be recording it as well. But uh, you can always send in your questions ahead of time if need be that we can ask Al uh, so we get it recorded. But thank you again. And uh, we will see you uh, next Thursday. Thank you all.